the latest end. Is the reflection so. too much? <laughs> <laughs> So if you want to be in hand. the frame, this is good, Bob. Here. yeah. If, if if when you're speaking and you're using the slides in the background, if you could stand where Bob's standing, that would be awesome. Okay. Yeah. All right. Do. You've got about that much space on the other side of the screen too. So Sarah, you're out of frame right now. So you're going to be here. You yeah. handle. I've got another right, right there. Room. That's the edge. Those, you're frame. You're the frame. I'm in the frame now. You're both at the edges Great. of the frame. Okay. Thank you. Ta -da. <laughs> So now that we're officially set up and on video, live streaming to the world, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> <Not with that. laughs> uh, why don't we are going to start with Bob? But before we do that, why don't we do a real quick go around with name and where you're from, just so that we can all ground ourselves. Want to kick us off? Uh, my name's Connor Teal. I'm on the Barry City Energy Committee. Been there for one year now. Well, nine months. <laughs> Brian Forrest, I'm auditioning for the uh, energy coordinator and most of the other sponsors. Great. I'm Kathy Boyd Walsh, and I'm on the Jericho Energy Task Force, and I've been there for just about five years now. I'm Sally Burrell, and I'm just getting on the fading Bristol um, Energy Committee to try to get it going. And also, <laughs> our town is about to talk about, there's a big meeting coming up about them bringing pipelines and gas pipelines. So it's a scary moment right now in Bristol for me. I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Let's keep going back there. Shar Osterland, co coordinator of the Supreme Court Energy Committee. Bruce Froman, one of the founding members of the London Dairy Energy Committee that's been going on here. I'm Jeremy Hilton, I'm the town energy coordinator for Wester, and a member of our committee. I'm Ann Miller, I'm on the Marshfield Energy Committee. I don't know how long we've been going. I'm the only founding member who hasn't resigned yet. So this is not the I'm Eric Bickard. I manage the Vermont branch of Coastal in New England. I uh, have an interest in starting, restarting the Energy Committee in Bradford. Oh, good. I'm Sally Ballou. I uh, started a Green Committee at the Condo Association where I live. Uh, I'm Payne Morgan. I work for Encore Renewable Energy and I live in Winooski and I don't think we really have an Energy Committee, so I'd like to get that going if I can. I'm Dottie Kyle from Warren, uh, reorganizer of the second iteration of the Warren Energy Committee about five or six years ago, and I'm trying to retire. Uh, the folks that we're passing the torch to didn't make it. Uh, Barbara Noyce Pulling, I'm with the Regional Planning Commission in Rutland. I work with 27 towns, so I have 27 opportunities to get an energy committee going. I'm Alan Johnson. I was, uh, after talking with meeting Bob about 10 years ago, about, I think, what, 10 minutes later, you had us form an energy commission? <laughs> um, I was one of the founders of the Hartford Energy Commission. I chaired it for about eight years and then got demoted to liaison when I was elected to the select board. So I'm about a year and a half into a select board, uh, three year seat. and. Um, I guess that's enough. <laughs> um, Doc Bagley, um, retired from Catamount Solar, been in the solar industry for about 15 years, um, here representing Stratford, Vermont. So Will Dodge, um, I joined the Essex Energy Committee last year. On the day that I joined, they said, well, can you be the chair? And I said, you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> it was not a joke. Um, so after several months of nothing happening, in March, I said, okay, I'm going to be the chair. And now I even have enough volunteers to make a quorum. And, we're, we're now. and you even joined us in New Hampshire. I did, yes, I came to the New Hampshire. He wins bonus points. He came to the version <laughs> of the Beacon Conference in New Hampshire last month, mm. two months ago. So, Bob, take it away. Take us off. I'm so glad you all are here. It's, you see, in some of the conversations I had this morning with people coming in, it seems there's a, a lot of folks in uh, our boats of, um, you know, having been going on an energy committee for a while and just for one reason or another, you know, starting to lose steam, either uh, lack of volunteers or maybe the town's already done a bunch of projects, you know, that were kind of the easy things to, to do and they're looking for something else to, to do and they just haven't quite gotten off the dime on next 
steps yet. Um, uh, aging committees, you know, uh, trying to find this next generation of younger folks to come in to take over. And, um, uh, you know, another thing that's happened in a, a local town, a, a really strong central leader uh, had to leave town, moved out of the area, and, and just didn't, you know, there's people that are interested in, in carrying on, but really nobody that's able, willing to take over the, the role of being the, the coordinator, which is really, you know, I started this work in 2002, um, helping to get energy committees going. We got a bunch going in a, a short period of time there. Um, but it seems like the one um, key to really having a successful committee is finding at least that one person that's willing to coordinate and make sure that the agendas are put together and that everybody is notified about upcoming meetings and willing to get out. And, and, you know, if you can have one person who's willing to do that role, it's easier to have the other people, you know, can come along and do the, the tasks that are needed to keep, you know, projects going forward. But uh, finding that one person is a challenge in our small towns when there's so many other things going on. Um, that does seem to be a, a key. Um, so what we, by working now with vital communities and have been started to work with a number of towns in the Upper Valley region that are in this boat. And so what we've been trying to do is to, through the VCAN list, excuse me, the, the um, vital communities list, and I've also uh, talked with Joey. This is up, you know, for anybody in Vermont, uh, in your towns. Um, she's willing to look through her VNRC and VCAN lists, put a notice out to anybody on those uh, lists that uh, we're trying to uh, pull together uh, people for a conversation on how do we get this thing going again in your town. Um, so uh, Ian is uh, the Americorps Corp, um, VCAN representative and he would be happy to uh, work with you on trying to find people in your town who have been um, involved one way or another. Um, we've also, another list that you can look at to try to find individuals is there's um, uh, accessible through the Department of Public Service a list of everybody who has a uh, on-site solar, a grid-tied on-site solar, who got a certificate of public goods. You can look on that list and find everybody in your town who has solar. Doesn't necessarily mean that they'd be willing to serve on a committee, but they've at least taken one step in their home to make a difference, and those might be people that you could tap. So these are a couple ways you can try to find people, and we can, um, we, when we put up our um, notes from this workshop on the VCAN um, site, we'll include links to get in touch with Ian and uh, also how to find the, the links to get the um, certificate of public good in your town so you can try to find people. Um, we're then trying, once we identify some folks, um, pull together a, a meeting, um, it's be good to at least get a, a several, two, three, four people who are committed to coming, then put the word out to the, the town, um, work with your select board to get them to put the word out and um, try to get as many people. If you have a front porch, porch forum or a listserv in your town, put that notice out to everybody and announce it again to everybody on the VCAN or um, CPG list and invite them to come to a meeting and talk about this idea. And then um, uh, Sarah's going to be talking a little bit more about this. There's um, uh, Vital Communities put together this Strategic Action Toolkit, uh, which is a great process to sit down and go through to help, um, and this is, it's online, but, and again, Sarah, it's called Strategic Energy Action Toolkit, and Sarah will tell you more about that, but it, it, it takes you through a process of, you know, uh, visioning and goal setting, uh, talking about strategies, objectives, and it's, it's a group process to try to figure out what do you want to do, how are you going to go about making that uh, happen, what are the town's uh, 
opportunities uh, and needs and assessment kind of thing. And it's a very step-by-step uh, -step process that will help you be more effective in your outreach and uh, goal setting and getting your projects developed and, uh, and uh, underway. Um, so I am going to keep my part pretty short. I just wanted to do a brief intro to some of that. Let me see if there was anything else that I wanted to Oh, you know, one other thing that might be helpful for some of you is one thing that we're working with now with a couple of different groups of towns in the Upper Valley is looking at the idea of multi-town energy committees. Mm -hmm. If you don't have enough volunteers or resources to do it on your own, and it's it's understandable because again, there's a lot of people working on a lot of different things. If you can get one or two people in your town, think about connecting with the, the neighboring town that again might have one or two people or two or three towns to pull together to have a multi-town energy committee. Who you can work on strategizing different projects and then even implementing certain projects. Again, Vital Communities has done uh, work in the Upper Valley to do weatherization and solarizing projects where uh, collective groups of towns have gotten together to implement these programs. And it's a lot easier to lift if you have others uh, around you working to promote the same effort. And again, I think Sarah and Ian will probably talk more about that idea. Um, I think that's enough for me right now. I was going to ask some questions, do a little polling, but I think it mostly came out um, when you all did your introduction. So um, I hope that we'll get some more discussion and get some of your particular questions out so we can all try to help to figure out how we can help you move forward. <coughs> yeah. Thanks, Bob. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, Sarah and Bob said my name is Ian Hitchcock. And I am the new AmeriCorps member serving with VCAN and the Vermont Natural Resources Council. I am very excited to be here with all of you and looking forward to hearing what your ideas are for how we can help you. Uh, what I'd like to talk mostly about today is some of the current opportunities that exist for energy committees to be engaged in programs that already have infrastructure, already are present, and are something that people can look into. So the first is the Climate Pledge Coalition. This is a new initiative that was put together by Governor Phil Scott and Mayor Myra Weinberger in Burlington to try to get Vermont to match the commitments that Vermont would have made under the Paris Climate Accord had the United States not been withdrawn from that agreement. Essentially trying to step up to the plate and say even though the federal government is not going to be honoring this agreement. This is still something that we think is very important and stuff that we can do together to make happen on our own. The Vermont Climate Pledge Coalition is made up of Vermont businesses, municipalities, and other organizations who say we are going to make some kind of a pledge to take an action to reduce our CO2 emissions, be it installing weather stripping, converting their light bulbs over to LEDs. You guys are energy committee members. You guys know the checklist of things that we do to start. But this is a way of just trying to bring in not just local communities that you all work with, but also businesses and other organizations as well, and give them a structure to do. Now, the Vermont Climate Pledge Coalition is something that is featured on the Vermont Community Energy Dashboard, and I'm going to just skip through a lot of this. There we are. Which, if you are not familiar with it, the Community Energy Dashboard is a tool that was put together by the Energy Action Network. And I will put in a plug for a talk that's going on by Rob Fish, uh, myself, and Jennifer Green uh, about the Community Energy Dashboard and the Climate Pledge Coalition. So if you guys want to learn more about that, you can come to the workshop this afternoon. But essentially, the dashboard gives you some amazing tools to organize your communities, to get a sense of what is going on in your communities, and to really have a baseline for action going forward. So, and I won't go through, I could do a whole presentation on the dashboard. Um, I'm not going to go through all those pieces now. If you guys are interested in learning more, we can get you in touch with Rob Fish and myself, who can show you kind of the nuts and bolts of how the dashboard works, how you might be able to use it, uh, and what you can do from there. And I know, you know, we were up in Essex speaking to Will's committee. Uh, you know, we're definitely trying to get the word out and make sure that it's a free tool that all of you know how to use and how to use effectively. 
one of the best expenditures of time of our energy committee that we did all year was having Ian and Rob come. Well, thank you, Thank you. <laughs> um, one of the other things that we would like to highlight is, as Bob said, we understand completely that a lot of these towns are small, that a lot of you have limited capacity, limited volunteers. We're all busy. We all get it. And so the one important thing that I would want to leave more than anything else is that you are not in this alone, that you do not have to do all of this with just your town, and that when towns come together and regions come together, they can do a lot more and do a lot more ambitiously than a single town could do alone. One example of that that I saw was a button-up campaign in the Upper Valley just this last year, where there were five energy committees that put together a button-up event in one place. And so that just expanded their reach exponentially. It meant that they were able to reach more people. It meant they were able to have more businesses come in and sponsor it. This wasn't just a button-up event where they were putting out a table and putting out light bulbs, which is great and awesome and we love it. But they were also able to get into a school, to have sponsors come in and demonstrate their products, to connect people with local businesses that would be selling them products that could get things done, and to bring in a local band and do some music, because the one thing we don't want to forget is that all of this can be really fun, really inspiring. Don't forget the food trucks. And don't forget the food trucks. Thank you, Al. The most important, the most important piece. <laughs> it's a lot easier to get food trucks when you've got five committees with five times the people and five times the connections and five times the ideas. And that is really where VCAN can come in and help. And that's really what our role is, to try to connect you with the other committees and the other leaders who are doing similar work, who are interested, so that we can pull these things together. And that's a big part of what my role is going to be going forward once the conference is over, is figuring out what are some opportunities to bring regions together so that you single committees don't have to go it alone. Another place I would strongly encourage you guys to go is the VCAN website. We're going to be unveiling a shiny new website very, very soon. Uh, we're hoping to have it today, but it's not quite ready yet. Uh, but on there, we've got resources, contact list. We've got a map of every energy committee that we've got in Vermont, along with contact information. The one thing I will say about our map is it is only as good and only as up to date as you all help us make it. So when you have changes on your energy committee, please reach out to us at VCAN, send us a quick email saying, hey, this person left, this person moved out of town, I'm the new person to contact. Um, because, you know, the only way that we can connect all of you with everyone else who might be able to help is if we know how to get in touch. We're not omnipresent, and we understand that with, you know, all volunteer groups, there's not necessarily the infrastructure in place to do that. So when I get a group of y'all in the room, I say, please, 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 let us know what the best ways to contact you are and the best way to connect you with other people. One of the things you'll also see on the VCAN website is a list of resources, similar to what Bob mentioned, that we'll be sending out later on. And one of the best resources on there is the Strategic Energy Action Toolkit, which I will tell you about right now. I also want to give a plug for another one that's on there is the Vermont uh, Town Energy Action Guide, or was that one? Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh, thank you. I forgot about that. So, because we <laughs> just updated it. Um, We've got kind of the equivalent, the local Vermont version of kind of our years of experience. In my case, it's like two months of experience, but there's been people that have been on the job far longer than me who've had really good ideas and put them together in a single document called the, I'll come up with the name later, but it's like the Vermont Climate, like, I will come up with a title later, but it's essentially, it's our, it's our document. We'll send out a PDF to all of you all that has kind of our list of what are some best practices for running a meeting. How do you go in your communities and identify volunteers? How do you recognize volunteers so that they want to keep volunteering and don't feel burned out? Uh, and just other resources like that. Thank, Thank you, Bob. Do you have a sign up sheet? Yeah. I'm going to make a, I'm, we're grassroots organizers, so I'm going to make one <laughs> right here. Awesome. Uh, so while I'm pulling up, these next couple of slides for you. Uh, you should also know that our neighbors in New Hampshire, I cross the state line, so I work on both sides of the river, and um, there's a similar map and contact list in New Hampshire, and I presume also Massachusetts. For any of us that are actually near or on the border, cross-state partnership is also a really wonderful thing. What's the New Hampshire equivalent of VCAN? Called? Yeah, it's called the Local Energy Solutions Work Group. Um, I'm the chair at the moment, so you've got a nice in if you're curious <laughs> to learn more. Um, we are, it's a little more ad hoc than um, 
than Vermont, but a similar idea, and they have an annual conference, typically it's in November, you certainly know, uh, but very similar. And and uh, in the Upper Valley, we try and do a lot of uh, cross-state partnership when we can. So, uh, as Ian and Bob mentioned, I am going to show you just a little hint of a tool that it can be really helpful for committees who are trying to re-energize. Um, this is something that I would be happy to talk with any of you more about another time. I'm really going to fly through. I also just want to reiterate who we are, because for those of you not in the Upper Valley, vital communities may not mean anything to you. Um, we are a community-based organization based in White River Junction, and so we serve this whole middle heartland of Vermont and New Hampshire, which is 69 towns. Ooh. Yeah, did you have a question? No, no, I oh. don't want, want you to finish your thought and then I'll ask it. Oh, it's okay, go um, for it. So um, this is something that I've noticed is that um, there's a big boost in the strength of energy committees in Erie, or maybe um, it's a perceived strength on my part, um, of energy committees in areas where there's somebody who's like a paid coordinator. Um, and I'm wondering what, um, if, you know, if you could kind of weave that into what you're talking about, yeah. whether there are resources available to communities that don't have somebody like that, but there might be other organizations. It sounds like you're alluding to that, but yeah. um, so in Vermont, do, how do you move into yeah. getting something like that going? In Vermont, <coughs> when you talk about the, the umbrella backbone structure, it really is BCAN and Ian specifically um, statewide. In the Upper Valley, we happen to have an, another organization. So I do what Ian does for the rest of Vermont in the Upper Valley. It gives him but a break. Bob and, Bob is that and Bob works with me directly with Vital Communities. We are a tag team. Oh, um, right. That's right. Used to be Surge. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's all very confusing. Yes, the Sustainable Energy Resource Group is what we used to call Bob's shop, and then right. that is now just part of what we do. And then the regional planning commissions are the other, but their ability to support ebbs and flows with their funding. Right now, many of you are working with them on your enhanced energy plans, um, so they're able to provide some support there, but um, that's but typically I, what it looks like. I would say, I, I do think, well, I think everybody should work through VCAN and, and do the statewide thing. I do think having the regional coordinator has been very helpful for the efforts in the Upper Valley. Yeah. And there has been discussion in the past about is there a way that we can, you know, get kind of regional coordinators in other places throughout the state, it, you know, on a paid, on a paid yeah. basis because it, it's a lot of work and it, it really is helpful, I think, to have somebody like that. It hasn't happened yet, but I think it's an idea that we should keep on the table to tr try to have that eventually. Yeah, and I'll be the first one to say, you know, as someone who's been on the job for a few months, and American Commission is only, you know, 11 months of time, which means that, you know, you guys are seeing new versions of me year after year. Um, they and, tend to stick and around, that means that the continuity <laughs> can sometimes be challenging. And so we hear you, and we completely understand, you know, when you've got one person to cover the whole state, some things are going to get focused on and some things aren't. And so that's where really I see our role as as much empowering and connecting your regions as they are empowering myself, because I'm only, I'm only one person, and I'm, I'm okay, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot more. <laughs> Let's make sure to circle back to this topic once we're done. If we fly through this, we can then really get into the discussion. Um, so it's also helpful to note that, that we have all seen this. In the Upper Valley, we've gone from 7 to 40 in 10 years, and a lot thanks to Bob, but um, once you, we've established this kind of network, which we do have in Vermont, we've, we've got to figure out how to sustain it. So I'm just going to breeze through this quickly. This um, resource, which I'm happy to talk with you more about afterwards, was developed um, in collaboration with a whole bunch of folks around New England. Um, it was mainly through the New Hampshire equivalent of VCAN that we really dug into it, because we were all hearing from energy committees that they were feeling a little uh, scattershot in their approaches and struggling to figure out how to, to rein in the passion that typically comes to the table when you bring together volunteers to talk about energy and focus that in, in really strategic ways that are, are good match projects for the kinds of issues we have in our communities and the kinds of resources we have to deal with them. Um, so that's where this came from, but it's all the tools I'll walk you through are also really helpful for re-engaging, recruiting volunteers, and um, reviving energy groups. 
So there's a couple of sections to this, and I'll just give you the highlight of what's here, and again, you can follow up with me later. Um, there's some guidance on how to lead a conversation with a group around goals and vision, um, a template to fill out to go and find what's already been done, and some uh, questions to, to pose to help self-facilitate a conversation that really digs into why are we here and what are we trying to achieve, which is something that, that our groups typically don't take the time to actually state often enough. Second, there is an assets map exercise, which is dead simple, but, but a lot of us kind of forget to do this. Um, we did this with Hartford a few years back. Uh, the idea that even if you've got three residents in the room, if you put all your brains together and thought through who the individuals, the organizations, the institutions, and the, the broader picture context are for your particular community and have that as a reference to be able to keep coming back to when you're trying to pull projects together, the very basic step and takes you know all of about a meeting to pull together, but can be really helpful and weak grounding. Uh, this is an, another framework that um, I most recently helped the town of Hanover, just across the river in New Hampshire, complete. Uh, this is the idea that as a group of volunteers, how can we get a grip of what our community needs from us? You can bring a lot of passion to the table, but trying to match that with the right opportunities and challenges can be tough unless you take the time to, to kind of map it out. So our recommendation is that you, you split up the who and you split up the what, and you think through where are our residents challenged and, and excited in their electricity use or their heating. And you think about the same <coughs> question with respect to your schools and respect to your businesses. And if you take a, a meeting or two to map that out, you can start to see where the real levers of opportunity are for your particular community. And it's going to vary based on where your community's at in, in their time frame and, and geography. But this, this baseline conversation can, again, really ground and help move forward. And then there's some resource in here about the what you could do now that you've got a good baseline of, of what you want um, and why you're there. The What we did is, um, with help from our advisors, split up the what into four categories and tried to capture all of the different things that, that we as volunteer energy committees could possibly do to have a real impact in our community and actually list them so that you as an energy committee can just run through top to bottom and get a sense of what have we done, what's totally off the charts, and what, what might we want to do next. And they're in four buckets. There's a planning and policy bucket, a municipal and school energy use bucket, a everyone else, which is where you reach out and do all of your education and such. And then there's regional collaboration, which is VCAN and, and multi-town groups, et cetera. And so there's, there is actually a checklist online and in here that you could run through with your group to, to get a sense of, of where you're at in the greater scheme and what's possible. This all available online? Oh, yes. Yep. And we'll send it out. Um, I also have some versions of the paper version and, and by request can make it <coughs> And then finally, there's the where do we go from there once you've thought about why we're here and what we could possibly do. We put together some tools to help narrow the focus and come up with the projects that people have the passion for, you've got the resources to actually make some progress on, <coughs> and they're a fit with what your community really needs. Um, one of the most helpful tools in there is a scorecard. We've got a template that we encourage communities to adapt. The idea is that you come up with the questions and the criteria seven or eight of them or so, that if, if you were to score your project idea based on those eight criteria, the projects that come out with the highest score at the end of the day are, are, are likely to be the ones that are really the best fit. And when I've done this with communities, I've done it in communities where they're looking at eight different projects that they're considering because they're, they're a place where they want to to shift focus and they have no idea how to, how to compare them. I've run them through this process and typically two or three rise to the top and they may or may not be what's expected, but it provides a way to have an objective conversation about what we're doing and why, which helps people to set aside the pet projects for a moment and, and come together in some consensus around what we really could be doing together. So very helpful and very adaptable.
And then there's also a template which you can take or leave, but it's like project management 101. How do you then actually operationalize, which is a really hard thing to do as a volunteer committee. So there is, there is at least some template that you can start from if you're struggling from that perspective. And that's all I'm going to show you of it, but obviously you are more than welcome to chat with me afterwards. And um, what I'd really like to do now that you've gotten some taste from us is um, maybe we do a little rearranging of chairs and get into more of a circle and we can spend the next 35, 40 minutes or so talking to each other about what we're seeing and what we need help with. Is that good? If we want to stay on camera, for the benefit of those who may oh, watch this, um, try and circle over here, and I'll I'll let you know if we're outside. <laughs> well, I'm going to move the camera once people get settled, but I'll try and keep you out of it. Is that good? All right, I'm going to try and get some everyone in the shot. This is going to be tricky. Thank you, Alan. But this is a this distinction I think is between an ad hoc committee yeah. as opposed to one that's affiliated with the town. Um, we um, have a different, slightly different um, paradigm, which is that instead of having appointed members, we have voluntary open, um, sort of anyone can come in, and um, so there's not a specific term of office, and you don't have to go through a process. Anyone can come to the meetings, and anyone can join in. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, but we are still affiliated with the town. And uh, we also we have no energy committee. Um, I'm going to put a select to review on Tuesday to be the energy board because of this is kind of Yeah, that's a question I had. Um, in Vermont, you can have energy coordinators. Mm -hmm. And how does that usually work? Appointed you know, by the select board. And, and, and um, how? How are the duties different? Are there usually committees underneath this coordinator? There's a statute um, that states, and I have it right here if you want to take a look at it, um, that states uh, what the duties are uh, and obligations. And just on a practical level, how does it work? Are you a one person? <laughs> are you a one person? We've got a couple people this year. Okay, I became, I think somebody else said this, I became co-coordinator at my first meeting because nobody else wanted to do it. And I had I just thought it was like a chair and then and then later on, way later on, I looked through, I don't know if there's a town chart and I oh I'm supposed to be doing that and it wasn't very there was a list of things that I didn't think I had signed up to do. But um, there was a little bit of confusion. We're supposed to be because we were not one of the original committees were supposed to be evaluated and they have to like reissue and they haven't done that. So it's a little bit loosey goosey. But that's and I just kind of yeah, yeah, I just kind of okay. accepted. Did you have anything to add? Oh, I'm in an interesting situation where I called to talk to the town energy coordinator and said, Oh, there is not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Probably not so unique. 
Yeah, so right. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is that our select board specifically told me they don't want an energy committee sanctioned by the town. They said, I'm welcome to go start one that's not officially associated with the town. Even though the, the select board is supportive of having an official town um, energy coordinator. Yeah. Well, did they give you a reason why? You know, they did, and it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Um, they were concerned that the open meeting laws are like an insurmountable hurdle. Like, uh -huh. That was all they focused on, was that I'd have Jeez. to give two weeks notice before having a meeting. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. But to be fair, it's, it's, not a big deal. it's fine. Um, and for the committees that do open meeting law, you just do it. But I, in my experience, working with all the committees I work with, whether they're ad hoc or not, doesn't seem to really make a difference in terms of what they can accomplish unless they have the select board won't listen to them because they're not a committee. Which doesn't necessarily matter if you're ad hoc or. Right. Official, <laughs> it's you know? true. It really that depends on who's sitting on the board. But I, I would say, though, in my experience, if you can get the de if you can get the select board on board and get the designation as an official town committee, I think there are a couple of advantages. In Deford's case, and I know some other towns, we have a seven hundred and fifty dollar annual budget that we can use because we're an official committee, we get that from the town. And I think in some people's eyes, if you're an official committee, you know, th there's some you know belief that you know you're maybe more official, and you have more standing, maybe you have more um, clout with the select board in you know, planning and trying to do some things in town. So I would say it's probably worth trying to get the select board, but if you can't, go ahead and do it as an ad hoc committee. There's and of course, either way, members. you need the volunteers, period, yeah. to yeah. make it work, yeah. which is a problem, yeah. Um, in Lennon area, we did have an energy coordinator. And his first initiative was to try and get the town signed up with PACE, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. which seemed to come and, come and go. But then one of the select board members formed an energy committee, although he's not a board member of this. Um, but given that committee and that official sanction by the select board, then we were selected by the Lyndon County Commission to, or to a um, regional commission to work on our um, enhanced energy plan. The town just, mm -hmm. planning commission just put through a new energy, you know, a new town plan. Right. And we came behind and just at a meeting on Tuesday, we should finally, finally, you know, approve a new enhanced energy plan, which was extremely helped by having the regional commission. But none of it would have happened if we weren't in energy committed. Mm -hmm. And so now that we have this plan, our question is, one, is the select board going to go for it? And then two, if we do go for it, how do we implement it? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my question is um, about committees interacting with staff of the towns um, and um, like what tasks town staff people will do that um, it's yeah. totally there. Yeah, I don't laugh, please. <laughs> please don't laugh, that's so disheartening. It's a good question. It's a good question. We're laughing from you know, experience. If we, if we try to do it as some just information seeking, you know, for as a town energy committee, you know, I don't know the first thing about electricity, really. I mean, um, and trying just to get the information about what do we use as a town is just like, oh. if, if I could, I think that's, that's a spot where we can really rise to step in, um, because if nothing else, we know people who know things. And so, I should mean, that's, that's very bad. Um, but that means, like, when you have these questions, you know, te be they technical questions or policy questions, like, I may not know the answers, but we've got a, you know, a planning staff member at the NRC who literally planning is all she does, and energy planning is part of that. You've got regional planning commissions who are, you know, I just want to jump off of Bruce's point a little bit, talking about how the enhanced energy plan is another opportunity for committees to plug in and do something because Act 174 requires that regions and towns come up with energy plans that in part determine where they want to use their energy or not. So it's a good opportunity to plug in and say, now that we've got this mandate to think about these things, that means that there's an opportunity. People may be looking for, hey, who can actually help us put together these plans? And that's a perfect place for the energy committee to plug in in some of these communities where maybe they feel they're not supported. Uh, but back to your point. 
you can ask us and we can find out answers to the question you need. Okay. And I would just also say, I think it really does depend in terms of how cooperative various folks are in town, like in our town. To get the energy use information, we went to our um, uh, our town treasurer uh, is the one who gets all the bills, so I think that might be a good person to kind of communicate with. Also, you know, and, and they're from different departments. It could be the highway department, it could be you know, the town buildings, you know, so and they have different accounts, so you need to ask the treasurer to think about the various accounts. We also have the select board assistant who helps us get our minutes and agendas on the uh, website, which is another part yeah, of the yeah, open meeting law that we have to do. Yeah, we have that. But I wonder if it would be helpful to, for us to um, for us to have information about how the um, different committees are structured within the VCAN database. Like, I believe it's there, and that's part of the, what the guide is that you know, kind yep. of, it's just been updated. It's all about these structures. And the name of the guide that I got at is the Town Energy and Climate Action Guide. Uh, we'll send out the PDF to that as well. But it does, one of the things that's in there is, as you said, like, what are some different models for how long it's structured? Thank you for the air time. Yeah, and I would just add to both of those questions. Really, they kind of play into each other, you know. Um, the, your question and his question. I think that you have to consider how much staff the town has uh, as a major factor as to whether or not it forms an ad hoc committee or as a uh, official, official committee. Mm -hmm. And when in doubt, just get started as an ad hoc. Just start meeting with people that want to get together, and then you don't have to worry, worry about open meeting laws, which are not insignificant. We still we have a fantastic staff, especially for energy. <laughs> we just hired Vermont's first full-time energy coordinator conference, so uh, paid by the town staff. So it's, it's a very exciting time for us in the energy committee. Um, but it also is a very transitional time. We're starting a lot of challenges around energizing the energy committee uh, that we're hopefully on the far end of. But you you want to consider that. And there are a number of factors, and I would just say start as an ad hoc, have a few meetings, You'll figure out eventually if it makes sense for you to you know, approach the select board and ask them to appoint you as an official town committee. But also recognize that, yeah, you can get money from the town. We didn't for years. We got you know, little, little bits, right? We always gave Serge a little something. Um, but you also, if you're a town committee, you can't accept private funds, right? So look at who the resources in your town are who might be able to donate and might be interested in helping out privately. So. And you can get money from the town, not just from the town's budget, but from the voters if you're an ad hoc committee, right? You can get listed on as a, an appropriations on ballot. Um, they have a whole process with that. Um, it's enough of the civic lesson for them. But conversely, as a town committee, you can uh, solicit grants that yes. go to the town mm -hmm. for energy mm -hmm. projects. More grants. There are grants that can go yep. to ad hocs as yep. well, but yes, there are more. One other structure that we've seen used, which albeit is more ambitious and takes a lot more time, is energy committees becoming their own nonprofits. So you have the Waterbury Leap Committee yep. in Waterbury, for instance, which is its own 401c3. Oh, 501c3. See, I'm still learning Four the lingo. I'm still learning the lingo. Um, but essentially, that means that they can really do their own fundraising get funds where they need it, and they're not dependent upon the approval of a select board or the approval of town. So that, that's obviously a much bigger lift, but that's just some, another possibility. Mm -hmm. yep. I have a question for sure. Bob. Bill first. Sorry. How involved are town energy committees with saving money for the town? You know, for the town expenses. Is, is that been a, something that's been done? where leadership on the committee really helped the town make, make a big dent in the, in the municipal. So, so what are some stories about that? Because I'm not hearing it. When I volunteer for committees, I don't see people working. Because you're working something. with committees that are quite mature and have done a lot of it already in Norwich and others. But most committees start there. And I'm seeing so much head on it because I think everybody's done street lights and energy audits on major buildings. I mean, there's some basic stuff that most of the established committees have already So that's done. early work. And well, should be ongoing work, but often it is early work, yeah. Is so there anything else that you can 
help me understand about that? We'd be happy to chat with you on line if you if you'd like about that. And that's no, I won't do it online. <laughs> no, I mean <laughs> <laughs> outside, <laughs> outside of this discussion, more than happy. But I do think, especially for groups that are maybe newer or trying to get support of select board. You, know, you need to know to your audience and who, what their interests are. And for a select board, saving money for the town is, is key. So if you can think of those projects that are not only going to help save energy, save the planet, but also going to save the town money, and those are the kinds of things that you can talk to the select board about, it's going to you know, make them say, hey, I'm all on It's also team. helpful for volunteer recruitment. I've had committees yeah. that have some pretty hardline libertarian members who are there because they're really excited about getting tax dollars down, which is actually fabulous because they're really creative and really go after the town projects. And they're not typically a, a group that we automatically go to for volunteers. Well, thank you all very much. One example, just to answer your question there, um, South Hero had a, the town office weatherized, secured funding, replaced furnaces. They saved the taxpayers $3,102 annually. So there's one example. And a question for you all. Would it be helpful for VCAN to compile yes. a um, list? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, yes. <laughs> I will say that uh, all, you know, the dashboards, you can't, so, so the city, for, I'm from Montpelier, and so we went on and we like have tracked our projects on the dashboard to try and be an example. Um, so yes, when you have a project that had a certain amount of savings, you can put it either as a pledge a completed pledge, or you can put it as a like a case study thing. And so, one, if you go to the dashboard and you filter for municipality, you would you could potentially kind of like have that function already without VCAN having to reproduce it in a different way. Um, um, I've got a, a question and also wanted to do a clarification on, on these new enhanced energy plans. Um, they're not required. Of, of any towns. Um, it, it's a voluntary thing. But if you do go through, and it is an arduous process, uh, and uh, it does take some assistance, uh, if you do go through, you usually end up with a quite long list of actions that you're going to do. Um, and, and that's where I think energy committees and coordinators uh, will come in handy uh, instead of just handing this over to a planning commission or a select board. Just actually making these things happen. The, the question I had, uh, you were mentioning, you know, partners with uh, being partners with like businesses and institutions. How easy is that to get them involved in the, the energy realm? Depends on the community. Some of our communities have a very strong uh, small business or even institutional base, and so for communities where you can't really talk about energy without talking about your business community, I've had groups that have done a really good job going and networking with their businesses and connecting those businesses with Efficiency Vermont, which is typically what you do when you're working as a volunteer. You're just trying to raise awareness and make connections. Um, but some of our towns, that's more or less irrelevant because the, it, we're more bedroom communities and, and the, the time is better spent elsewhere. It really just depends. But it has to end a community that's got a big institution like a Dartmouth or a Middlebury or a um, BTC, then you've got to be talking to those folks as part of talking about energy in the community because they're such a big user and employer. Right, I'm thinking of like uh, businesses like GE or something like that that don't even have a headquarters in Vermont. Right, so we don't, our, the communities I work with don't touch that level. <laughs> Mostly it's if you've got um, locally owned businesses that are paying tax dollars in the local community, that's where most of the time our committees have been focused. We have, like a, we have an appointed seat from some of those institutional representatives mm -hmm. on our committee. They don't usually come to the meetings very often, <laughs> yeah. but they're on they're on the membership list and they get all the emails and then you know we can go to them if we have a particular topic that we need to talk about. I mean in, in our case we have the, the state of Vermont building some general services. Um, we have GMP, we have a few other people who have like a, a designated seat. Um, we don't we don't have national but um, 
But yeah, so that, that could be one strategy is we, you can go to Dartmouth or whatever and say, you know, do you appoint someone to be your representative? And that's actually makes me think of a couple of other things. I know in, in Denver Valley there's a uh, high performance, a very progressive big business. They actually uh, have uh, a thing in their um, policy where they pay staff time for their associates to work on volunteer projects. Mm -hmm. So to you know go to them and say, do you have any people in our town who might be willing to work on an energy committee? Might be a good way to find. And the other thing that we've done in um, Thetford is try to reach out to the, our school. Thetford Academy has a, an environmental committee and to try to get kids, high school kids, maybe not official energy committee members, but to, at, at least to sit in and get young ideas and also help them as they go forward and think about getting involved in the community. So I have a question about sort of taking <clears throat> the weatherization problem, which I see it is that um, in part people with means are weatherizing and people without them are not. And you drive through like my town and I look at the housing stock and I'm like, those houses should either be replaced entirely or it's going to take a huge, it's going to take people actually like knocking on doors and volunteering to weatherize <laughs> is basically it. it. I'm just wondering if there's any precedent for that at all, or is is the model always know what you have to do is to raise money and then pay a con I mean I guess pay a contractor to do it. I just wonder about that because like with button up, we're telling people about all the things that they can do to weatherize their house, and I did it. It took me a day, and I'm so glad that I did it. But I keep thinking there's so many people who would you know might not know like how to take your door off to then put the stuff on it and. Did you plan? Did you plan? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really, I, I've been thinking about that a lot, and I, I don't know if there's I, any I, model at all. I've thought about it quite a lot, and I, um, I can see us moving towards educating young people, the next generation, so that there's really an energy-minded person in every block who's available to do the work. And you know, it's it's job creation and climate economy, but. Um, Trying to get the older generation to do it only goes so far. We really need to bring people on board with the skills, you know, BPI training and being good with their tools and being affordable because their work is right in your neighborhood. So to answer your question, um, the you your talk there's a lots of scales of weatherization. I think what you were just talking about is some of the more do-it-yourself, right. window plastic, weather stripping, stuff that we all should be doing. Um, there's also the the more significant investments, several multiple thousands of dollars, where you do actually need a trained contractor to help you in these cases. And then there's the whole building retrofits that are tens of thousands of dollars that most people aren't able to access. Um, on the the low end that you were just talking about, the button up and how do we be more effective, uh, because this is difficult to talk to people about, it's not very sexy to talk about weather stripping, that key is to go where people are and energy committees often will take this on themselves as saying, we know this is important to our, in our communities and we literally just have to be the pavement and you try and put a start and end date on that so that you don't burn out as a volunteer team and do it in blitzes, but you, you don't host a button up event and expect people are going to come, I mean, you can, but more importantly you go and you present to the Rotary or you go and you, you do a workshop in the church or you get yourself into the, into the school and partner with the um, and and be persistent about it because you're not going to hit everybody in your one little two month blitz. You're going to have to do this year after year after year. But if it matters, then you can do that. And we've got great support in Vermont from Efficiency Vermont and uh, Vermont Energy Education Program and others who are providing the, the handouts and the material in some cases to make that possible. Yeah. And then there's a <laughs> um, and then there's that the larger investment stuff that um, is a little harder to afford, and that's where you've got to be teaming up with your local contractors, and you've got to be teaming up with Efficiency Vermont and your neighboring committees. And your neighboring committees, and there's like a session later today about how to 
inspire more weatherization in our communities. It's a really hard thing to do as an energy committee. We've made some traction in the Upper Valley with a program called Weatherize Upper Valley that's targeted at the multiple thousands of dollars kinds of projects. Um, but it is hard and it requires persistence. But as you just said, it is the most important thing we could be focused on, that in transportation in terms of really helping people get their costs down. Yes, I, I was just going to say, we looked, um, this is like, the Energy Committee didn't do it, but another committee on it. We just went to the transfer station because everybody was there. It was a social place. Plus, people like to talk there. And the grocery store, they're too busy. <laughs> but, 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 we did okay at the grocery store. Yeah. We had a lot of people talking. But, but what astounded me, and at least what you were saying, people were saying, oh, I already turned the heat down. We had the heat down to 53 degrees. <laughs> I said, what? And, I, and the reality hit. Yeah, I mean, what do you think yeah. people have to live that way? I mean, it really hits home. Mm -hmm. we, we did, that firm put together a program a few years ago where we trained 50 volunteers and put together a whole bunch of resources to go door to door. We went to 650 homes, which was like two thirds of the town. Well, that was the home energy challenge, right? Yeah. Was it was the precursor to the challenge. It's what the challenge was built on, basically. But based, and we did go to a lot of doors and handed out materials. I, I will say it's a huge lift to do that. But if you can get the people to do it, we did, you know, have a pretty good impact. I think, you know, there's also another program that you can let people know about is the Low Income Weatherization Program, which provides free audits and weatherization services to anybody who income qualifies. So that is, you know, a good one that you could be doing. Any, I mean, you don't have to go door to door. You can do it from listserv. You can have tables, a town meeting, or wherever. But, but did you feel thing. that your door to door did it did it yield results? In other words, did you get people that probably otherwise would not going to show up to the Yes, I think that way we were actually reaching people who would not come to a meeting or that we might not find it, you know, a, a place that we wouldn't otherwise you know, the key did. question is how did you get fifty people? That's the question. But I want to hear that answer. It was, a, it was a unique situation, and I, it is hard to find that kind of volunteer force in any community. Yeah. That was a miraculous event. I mean, we actually, before that one, we had done some other things where we, for example, there's a, a community center in town that's loved and used but was in, in bad shape. Uh, and we got, again, about 50 volunteers to actually weatherize that building. We did a lot of the simple things the volunteers did, and then we had a professional contractor do some things. But if you can get those um, easier pro projects, maybe where there's some hands-on things that people can do, and they feel invested in the pro uh, the whole broader program up front, then you can maybe encourage them to do that next step that's a little bit bigger. Okay. Can I just jump in here real quick? I think Bob, Bob's. We have to recognize too that these these events that Bob's put together. First of all, Bob's. Bob, right? <laughs> and this is like a culmination of what, like two decades worth of, of outreach and community building and building a foundation. You know, so Bob can pull together 50 volunteers. It's like everybody wants to come help Bob because he's been doing this stuff for 20 years. You know, your, your mileage may vary. Um, what I think we found, uh, but I think is in the same lines as what Bob's talking about and the door to door stuff. Step back from the door to door and recognize that if you want to find people, we learned in Hartford to stop trying. We struggled early on with getting people out to events, and we decided to stop trying to get people out to events. You don't, it, it was just the choir showing up, and very small and that, right? So the choir comes out to events, but you have to go to where people are, which door to door is a form of going to where people are, <laughs> right? But, you know, we've done events at the transfer station, you know, just hang out at the dump for the day and talk to people as they come and go at the dump. You know, find other community events where there's going to be a lot of people and set up a table and get out in the crowd, you know, and talk to people and just be approachable and have some thoughts and say, hey, this, we did a, that button up event that we did that they were, uh, you know, was talking about, uh, that Ian was talking about. Um, leading up to that, every community that participated in that button up event went to some other community event and promoted the button up event ahead of time to get people to come to that, right? So we did the trunk or treat. We had hundreds of people this year show up at Harper's trunk or treat event, which was mind numbing. You know, there were just lines everywhere. It was crazy. Um, and we had a trunk or treat trunk about energy vampires. <laughs> the other thing is, um, so energy vampires. That's the idea that when you have appliances plugged in and they're oh, yeah. off, they're oh, yeah. still yeah. trunk or treat. Yeah. 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 
um, to add to what you were just saying, the um, the kicker is that when you go out and talk to the community, you've got to know what your message is. And there's so much that we could talk about related to energy. It helps to just pick one thing Leave and run with that for a little while. And Leave with money. Yeah. Everybody wants free money. Yeah. So. Thinking of that, that's a question I was about to ask. And how do we talk about a comparison down the line between something like solar and natural gas? You know, do we have information about that so that because it is money that's driving the select board to bring stuff in? It's you know, how do we find out? Those you're talking from the numbers. perspective of a community that's doing the pipeline conversation. Yeah, it's like anyone else in here have experience with that? Bob does. Any any wisdom to share? You can take it up. Well, just we're we're also working with people in the um, Lebanon Hanover area where Liberty Gap Liberty. Utility is trying to bring in a, a gas storage and pipeline facility into the other valley. And you know, right now the financial argument is a tough one. You know, but we are trying. There are economists out there who say that this is a you know the projections that like natural gas industry is making are not based on reality, and it's a bubble that they are living in right now, and it's going to burst pretty soon. And you know we certainly can point to you know efficiency and renewables prices coming down and being more stable going forward. And with a gas project, you're implementing this infrastructure that's kind of capitalized over 50 years and locking you into this program. And and who knows? You've seen the innovations in efficiency and renewables that have come down the pipe in the last 10 years. And you lock into this thing. And what's it going to do in terms of your being able to then switch to these more advanced opportunities. I think what you've got to do as a committee facing us to see a challenge is reach out to VCAN first and find out who else is already looking at it. No committee should have to reinvent the wheel around finding big data and, and leading big community conversations like you're about to have to do. Yeah. So don't start alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we um, we kind of have gone at our um, at reaching out to our community a little differently um, in terms of going where they are, which we've done somewhat. Um, to like Green Up Day, we have a we have a Green Up Day breakfast, so we usually have a table there. Um, one time we went to the hardware store, we got a good turnout. But um, we also have. Um, we have a movie uh, series in the winter time, so we try to get an energy-related movie in. Um, and so gradually over the years, more people have come. Um, and our most recent event, actually, it was that wind pump. So we had a push with uh, Efficiency Vermont in terms of publicity, but we had 40 people there that's the first time. We've had that many people. That isn't the same thing as getting more people in the community, though. Um, but it, it has uh, it has uh, really helped our notoriety too. The other thing is um, an interesting thing is that we use sandwich boards, and they're not that expensive. I mean, for a hundred dollars, um, you can get a sandwich board with uh, with letters and put it someplace that's visible to people. A lot of people. Um, a lot of people put down when we ch uh, checked who came to that event. Um, a lot of people put down front porch form, but a lot of people put down the, the sandwich boards that we have. We have two out. So I'm just mentioning it because it's not that expensive, mm -hmm. but it can help turn out a lot. But well, just to clarify, you, you, you shine some light on a very important concept where we were talking about before, at least in my mind, what I was speaking to was public outreach and just helping people who aren't going to come, you know, that aren't kind of inquire, right. be aware of the, the potential value to these things to them and their families. Right. But there's absolutely value in, in you know, this growing the choir and <laughs> trying right. to find more people to come out and help with Yeah, we stuff. haven't been able it's to grow the choir so much, you know? Yeah, it's a different challenge for sure. So we have reached the end of our time. Um, I would encourage us to continue the conversation for lunch. Did everyone get the sign around sheet? No. Bill, um, Bill, can you keep that going around? Yeah. Great. Um, come and give us your name before you leave if you'd like us to specifically send you some of the resources you saw today. We're also going to be putting it up online with the rest of the conference downloading. Um, I would just encourage all of you and all of us to not think about the challenge of um, finding volunteers and re-energizing as something that you have to tackle alone. It's a particularly um, helpful topic to be tackling with some of your neighboring committees.